thank you, thank you, Marsha and Jacob, for that. Let me welcome you here to this hour of worship this morning. To those of you joining us online, welcome. Thank you for being with us online. We're glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. Um, as you look around, somebody said, was the first service this lowly attended as well? And I said, well, yes, it was. Um, I think some people are a little hesitant right now with COVID going the way it is, and so, uh, and that's fine, that's fine, but we're glad that you're here this morning. I will give you an update. Um, Cindy and Joel both uh, tested positive for COVID back at the beginning of the week, which is why we didn't have Wednesday night activities. Um, Cindy is feeling better today. Her husband, Philip, tested positive. He's feeling better today. Joel is feeling the same, hasn't, hasn't declined, hasn't gotten better. Joel's kind of hanging right there, uh, feeling the same as he was. I had shared with our deacons earlier in the week because I was exposed to Cindy on Monday especially, not as much Tuesday, but on Monday. I shared with our deacons that I was going to watch myself throughout the week and then take a COVID test this morning, so at 4.30 this morning. Um, I took a COVID test that was negative. I took a picture. If anybody would like to see just my blue line only, okay, fine, I'd be happy to. To show it to you, um, but uh, so that's why we're we're worshiping together this morning. But I'm glad that you're here. If you're joining us online, thank you for joining us online. There's a host of announcements listed in your bulletin. We'll trust you to look at those as time permits. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we do thank you for the opportunity we have to be here in your presence in your house this morning to worship together, whether here in person or online. Father, we thank you that we know you are in our midst and. Father, where two or three are gathered, the scripture tells us so are you, and so we count on that. Father, we thank you for bringing us to this moment. Father, we pray that you would speak boldly to us as we look into your word, and as we sing these songs of praise this morning, that they would be a sweet offering lifted to you, a reflection of the love that we have for you this day. Father, we pray that you would speak to us in such a way that we leave here different, having encountered your spirit this morning. Bless us as we worship. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Please stand and sing with me. Joyful, joyful, we adore them.
for being here and leaving us this morning and Cindy's absence. We are grateful for you. And Marsha and Jacob, thank you as well. Appreciate you helping to lead us to the throne. We're going to enter into a time of prayer this morning. And let me just remind you, these prayer sheets are available at the back uh, as you're leaving or even out this door as you're leaving this morning. Again, we have a variety of folks who are dealing with COVID still. Um, I've shared with you Joel and Cindy. Susan Dixler had it last last Sunday and was not here, but is recovering from that, as well as uh, Gene Minter and uh, some others who are still recovering. Bonnie Henderson had been in the hospital for several weeks, but is home now, and uh, she just sounds great. When I talked to her on the phone the other day, uh, she sounded like Bonnie again, so I was excited to hear from her. Ted McAllister is recovering from pneumonia and feeling better. He texted me a little while ago an update on uh, he is or, or on him rather as well. Some folks want to remember Debbie Rago, Debbie Ken Rago, Ken's father passed away this past week and his funeral is tomorrow. They are up in Pennsylvania. So remember the Rago family as they're grieving the loss of uh, Debbie's father-in-law, Ken's father, this past week. Um, also wanted to let you know our person of prayer for this week is Rini Jeter. Rini is uh, one of our church members. I know Rini travels a lot for work, and so I know she'd appreciate your prayers there. But she also has plugged in, helping out in our nursery on Sunday mornings, and uh, you can just be praying for her when it comes to that as well. Uh, in our first service, we had Scott and Dana Bell Bellamore with us. They were missionaries uh, working with collegiate students in Alaska. So a lot of our folks who have been to Alaska know Scott and Dana. Scott and Dana were here. They're on their way to Richmond because they are going to be appointed by the International Mission Board as collegiate ministries and ministers in the UK. And so they are here and will be trained as well as then going. Uh, we prayed for them in the first hour. We will again, but you can put a face, especially when it comes to our international mission offering in December, you can put some uh, faces with names there with Scott and Dana. Some other folks that are still dealing with um, loss recently, some families who have experienced loss and other issues. Uh, spoke with Debbie um, Atkinson and she is doing really well. She is out of UVA. She's having to stay in Charlottesville, having uh, this blood cells, stem cell transplant that she had recently. They're having to stay in Charlottesville cook for a couple more weeks before returning to their home here in Montana. But Debbie is doing great, appreciates all the prayers, um, and, and she and, and um, Wayne are doing really well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I would invite you to either affirm what I'm praying, pray for whoever the Spirit lays on your heart, um, or even one that we haven't mentioned yet. So let's go to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for this day. Father, truly it is the day that you have made, and God, we rejoice and are glad in it. We thank you, Father, for the way in which we see you moving in the lives of those who we've been praying for. Thank you for uh, Debbie Atkinson and for her feeling better as a result of the stem cell transplant. Father, pray for continued recovery for her. Lord, we uh, lift up the Ragos as they are preparing to celebrate Ken's father's life. Father, Debbie has said that he loved you so much, and so we know that he is in your presence at this moment. But for those who are here grieving, Lord, we pray for comfort. For others who have lost loved ones recently, Lord, we lift them up to you and pray again that you would just walk through them. You promised to take us by the hand and to lead us through the valley of grief. And so we pray that for folks who are experiencing loss. Father, for so many who are experiencing COVID symptoms and uh, have tested positive, Lord, that just are needing a healing touch for headaches and uh, to diminish, for fevers to be gone, for breathing to become better, for all of these things and the variety of ways that they're experiencing them, Lord, we pray that as you, the ultimate healer, would touch their lives and their bodies and help restore these functions to them. Lord, we thank you for Rini. We thank you for what she means to this church as she is plugged in. And Father, even for the help that she gives, not just to our two-year-olds in Mercer, but even now taking on leadership roles with that committee. Father, we pray your blessings on her throughout the week as she travels for work and other things. Lord, that you would just watch over and keep her safe. 
Father, for Scott and Dana, who are here at the first hour, who are being appointed as international missionaries to work with college students in the UK. Father, we lift them up as they begin the training process, and Lord, pray that you would be with them, continue to guide them as they seek your will for their lives. And Father, for each one of us, as we look into your word in a moment, speak boldly to us. Call us out, Lord. Discipline us in your love, if that's what's necessary. Affirm us, Father, in the, the ways in which we are being obedient. But Father, we pray that we leave here different as a result of having encountered the presence of your Spirit in this place today. So speak boldly to us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and living Savior. Amen.
might as well just go ahead and put a bookmark there. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at these verses uh, 22 and 23 in Galatians 5 that we began last Sunday. And so, again, it would be good if, if you just kind of stick a bookmark there. It will be easier for you to find it uh, for the next couple of Sundays. As you're making your way to Galatians, I want to tell you about a boy who had sat down at the kitchen table with his crayons and a piece of paper, a young, young boy, and he was sitting there drawing when his father walked up. And he said, well, son, what are you, what are you drawing? And he said, Dad, I'm drawing a picture of God. And his dad said, well, son, you can't draw a picture of God. No one, looks, no one knows what God looks like. The little boy thought for a second. He said, well, they will as soon as I'm done. <laughs> what does God look like? You know, we're on this journey to discover what God desires, how God desires to transform us. And most people would agree with the father in the story. No one knows what God looks like, but maybe that's one of the reasons that God created us. Maybe that's one of the reasons that God draws us into a relationship with him so that we can become the reflection of Christ to others and they can know what God looks like. He created us in his own image. So that we could, in a sense, show the world exactly what God looks like. Paul wrote that we are being conformed in Romans 8, 29. We are being conformed into the image of Christ. And as that transformation takes place, people should be able to see in us a reflection of our Heavenly Father. Like I said, we're on this journey to discover how God wants to transform us. What is it he wants to do in us? And we looked at that first Sunday a couple of weeks ago, that we are to be the sweet aroma of Christ to those who are perishing, to those who come in contact with us. Our lives should be this sweet aroma that others experience Christ through. And then last week, we began looking at the fruit of the Spirit. So... With that in mind, uh, my, one of the ways that, that I learned scripture, one of the ways I learned to hide scripture in my heart, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, is what Psalm 119 says. And one of the ways I did that was through music. People had taught me some, some songs to put scripture to. And so I've got a lot of scripture deep down in my heart that is set to music. And Music is a great way to remember things. If you've ever been driving down the road and a song from the 60s, 70s, or 80s came on, nothing after that era matters, but 60s, 70s, and 80s, it was some great music, and, and it'll come on, and all of a sudden, you'll just be singing along at the top of your lungs, and at the end, you'll go, wow, I haven't thought about that song in years, but it just came out. Why did it come out? Because music has a way of getting ingrained in us, and so I learned to put scripture to music, and one of those songs. I began to teach you last week. Hopefully, within the next two Sundays, you will have this memorized. We're not going to go into the other verses. We're going to just continue with the first verse in the coconut. So get your knocking knuckles ready. And remember, your knocking knuckles, if you do this, you line them up on a baseball bat, too, and it helps you with your swing. But you're not, and when I say coconut, you're going to go, I'm going to do that twice. And then on the third time, you're going to go, three times. But it's going to help us learn Galatians 5, 22 and 23. At the end of these next couple of weeks, you are be able to sing this song, not necessarily with the coconut part. That's not part of the passage. Uh, but it does make, make for a good song. So are you ready? Oh, the fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. The fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. If you want to be a coconut, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the Spirit because the fruit is Love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But next couple of weeks, we'll have that down. I want you singing it with me. <laughs> Look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, because that's what we're memorizing. Remember, Paul is writing here, if you go back to verse 13, he's talking about what does life lived by the Spirit of God looks like, look like. That's what we're trying to figure out. As God transforms us, what does it look like? And in true Paul fashion, Paul shares what it doesn't look like first. It doesn't look like this, but it does look like, and that's where we pick up in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Some translations say forbearance. Others say patience. Same thing. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Against such things there is no law. And we began looking at what Paul called the fruit of the Spirit last week. We looked at that first one, love. And we saw that there are people all around us who need to experience the fruit of love from us, and they can because we, as believers, have experienced the fruit of love in our relationship with God. Remember, John summed up God's being in three words. God is love. And so we looked at what does that mean. And among other attributes, God's love is inclusive. It's forgiving. It's self-giving. And initiative-taking is what we saw last week. And because we have experienced that love as Christ followers, now we have that love to give to others. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Our lives, according to Jesus in John chapter 15, are supposed to bear fruit. And then he says, not just bear fruit, but much fruit and more fruit. And so we know that our lives are to continually be producing this fruit for others. The fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be evident in our life so that we bring glory to God as people encounter us. We become the sweet aroma of Christ that we looked at that first week. Well, the Holy Spirit, we can't do this on our own, and so the Holy Spirit brings this fruit into our lives when we enter into a relationship with him. And as natural fruit matures and grows, so is this fruit in us intended to mature and to grow within us. The fruit grows and matures as we surrender our will to the will of God in our lives. And as the fruit of the Spirit grows and matures, we begin to look more and more like Jesus. Remember that it is fruit, singular, not fruit, plural. One fruit seen in nine characteristics of Christ manifested in the lives of believers. The fruit of the Spirit includes these nine distinct characteristics or Christian virtues. And I shared last week, they can be put basically into three categories. Now, not three categories alone, all three categories intertwined with one another. The first three, love, joy, and peace, have to do primarily with our relationship with God, our upward relationship to Him. We experience His love, joy, and peace through a relationship with Him. The next three deal with our relationship, enhance and, and deal with our relationship with God as well as others. And then the last three primarily deal with our relationship with God and ourselves, but it also affects our relationships with others. It's one fruit that manifests itself in nine distinct ways. Think of it, if you would, like a diamond and a facet of a diamond. A diamond has a variety of facets, and as you look at it and take in each one, it helps you see the beauty and the goodness and the value of that particular diamond. It's necessary to see the full splendor of the diamond. And in the same way, all nine manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit are needed for the full revelation of Christ to be revealed in us as his followers. Now, I share with you that I used to work in a produce department at Safeway store years ago, and it was my favorite department to sort of work in because I, I just enjoy fruits and vegetables. And so, unlike fruit in the store where you can go up and pick out the specific ones you want, these are all characteristics that God intends to grow in you. So in other words, you can't say, well, you know what, I just don't want to be patient, so I'm, I'm not going to pick the fruit of patience today. I, I don't care. I'm not going to be good to others, so I'm not going to pick that fruit. No, 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 we don't have a choice. These are characteristics that the Holy Spirit brings to us at the moment Christ enters into us, and then the Holy Spirit's desire is to mature them in us, so you don't get to pick and choose the fruit you want. You just have to deal with this fruit in your life. This morning, we're going to continue looking at the fruit and discover how the Holy Spirit wants to enrich, enhance our relationship with God by looking at these other two, which are joy and peace. So the second one that Paul mentions is joy. My children grew up hearing me sing Psalm 118, 24 to them on a regular basis, especially when they woke up in the morning as grumpy guzzas. You know? I would look at them and sing Psalm 118, 24. You know, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice 
and be glad in it. I will rejoice. Well, my kids loved it when I emphasized that part. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 24. Rejoice, Scripture says. We were created for joy. Notice I didn't say we were created to be happy. Nowhere in Scripture are you going to see where God wants you to be happy. He does want you to experience joy, though. Jesus lived and died on this earth to restore to us the joy that we had lost as a result of our sin nature. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He wants us to experience the joy of life. So why is it that people have such a hard time experiencing joy? Why is it that people can't find joy in their lives? Well, there was a young girl who had become a Christian, and she had been baptized one Sunday morning at church, and she went home, and she was just elated. She was dancing and singing all throughout the house because of her relationship with Christ. And her grumpy grandfather looked at her and said, Shame on you. You just got baptized and joined the church, and here you are singing and dancing on the Lord's Day. Well, just played at that little girl's that, 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 that little girl's feeling at that moment. So she went on out to the barn and climbed up on the railing. And on the other side of the corral fence, there was an old mule. And you know how mules can look all, well, Eeyore. And she looked at that old mule and said, Don't worry, old fella. I guess you have the same religion as Grandpa does. <laughs> We were created for joy, yet people have such a hard time discovering and experiencing it. In his book, Seven Deadly Sins, Tony Campolo wrote this. He said, joy in Christ requires a commitment to working at the Christian lifestyle, working out our salvation is the way scripture puts it. Salvation comes as a gift, but the joy of salvation demands disciplined action. Most Christians I know have just enough of the gospel to make them miserable, but not enough to make them joyful. They know enough about the biblical message to keep them from doing the things which the world tempts them to do, but they do not have enough of a commitment to God to do the things through which they might experience the fullness of his joy. I have to agree with Dr. Campolo on that one. So what is joy? If it's different from happiness, what is joy? Joy is a gratitude for having received a gift. And the deepest experience of joy that we can have is a result of the gift of God's love that we experience when we enter into a relationship with him. It comes as a result of the Holy Spirit taking up residence in our life. God is love, so when God comes and lives within us, we experience joy. The psalmist wrote, the Psalm 1611, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Nehemiah 8.10 tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Someone said joy is tuning in to what God is doing around you. Seeing the world through his eyes, picking up on his delight in us as his children. Anyone can find happiness for a while. Happiness depends on what is happening to you. Joy is different, though. Joy goes deeper. Joy is when your whole being sings because you have caught a glimpse of God at work. Joy can creep up on you and surprise you in unexpected places. The kind of joy that we experience as a result of entering into a relationship with God is not dependent upon our popularity. That kind of joy is not dependent upon our circumstances. It's not dependent upon receiving pleasure from the things that we think bring us pleasure. This kind of joy can only be found through our dependency and our position in Christ. So when we have entered into a relationship with Jesus, we begin to experience joy that we could never have imagined outside of that relationship. That's why Paul was able to tell the Philippian Christians in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And then a little later on, when you get to Philippians 4.10-20, and Paul begins to talk about a variety of 
difficulties that he had experienced. He was able to say that because of the joy of Christ within him. Those circumstances didn't determine his joy. Where Jesus wants you to experience life to the fullest. See, John 10.10 10 says this. I gave you the second half. Let me give you the first half now. The thief, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus says, so that you may experience life abundantly, life in its fullest, life filled with joy. Satan wants to rob you of your joy. And he'll use things like circumstances and situations. He'll use things like people in pride, like sadness and sickness. You name it, and Satan will use it to keep you from experiencing the true joy that comes as a result of our relationship with Christ. Satan will seek to distract us with other things that make us think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to experience happiness there. And so he distracts us with those things. As I thought about it. As I thought about, what are some things in our world today that Satan uses to keep us from experiencing the joy that Christ would have us to experience? I think one of the things right now that is a primary driving force that keeps people from experiencing joy is a four-letter word. It's called fear. Years ago, years being within the last five years, I think, if I remember right, I remember reading an article, and the article used this acronym, FOMO. FOMO, what is FOMO? F-O-M-O. -O. Well, it's something that teenagers were dealing with at that time. They were dealing with FOMO. FOMO, fear of missing out. Fear. They're afraid, I'm not going to get invited to the party. I'm not going to get invited to the dance. I don't have a crowd to fit in with. Fear of missing out. Out. Fear is a driving force. It's one of Satan's tactics that he uses to keep us from experiencing joy. We experience fear in a variety of ways. We experience fear, I'm not going to get a job. I'm afraid I'm not going to get that job. Or I'm afraid I'm going to lose that job. There are people who are in abusive, abusive relationships that are afraid to leave, not because of the abuse, but they're afraid that they won't have anybody if they leave that relationship. So fear keeps them in the relationship. Fear is a joy thief. It keeps us from experiencing the joy. I have a fear of failing. I have a fear of getting a virus. Now, please don't, please don't hear me wrong. This virus is real. People are dying from it. People are getting sick. As a, we got a number of people who are out because they're sick with COVID. But fear can get a grip on you, and it can keep you from experiencing joy. It can keep you from experiencing church. It can keep you from experiencing a variety of things in life because of fear of a virus. Folks, if we will just remain diligent, if we'll remain wise, you know, right now, Debbie has knee replacement coming up. I'm in public, in crowds, I'm going to wear a mask, partly because I don't want to get sick and get Debbie sick. But it's not fear-driven, it's respect. Fear has a way of crippling us, and so my mom was great at encouraging me to memorize scripture. Uh, again, around my late teens, when the Lord really got a hold of my life, and my mom was one of those that was just speaking into me and reminding me, and my mom has scripture memorized. Man, she can just pull the scripture out. Even at 90 years old, she can just remind me. She says, well, Paul said in Galatians, or this, or that. And my mom would really encourage that in me. And so there are a variety of things, passages, that when I begin to experience things in my life, they just automatically come out because they're inside of me. And Scripture says, out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks. And so when we hide Scripture in our hearts, it's what comes out in those moments. And so I just want to encourage you, if fear has a grip on you, check out 2 Timothy 1.7. Because Paul wrote to Timothy, we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And so I remind myself of that. When Satan tries to allow fear to keep me from experiencing joy, I pull that out. No, 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 no. I've not been given a spirit of fear. I've been given a spirit of love, of power, and self-control. 
D.L. Moody expressed it well when he said, Joy flows right on through trouble. Joy flows on through the dark. Joy flows in the night as well as in the day. Joy flows all through persecution and opposition. It is an unceasing fountain bubbling up in the heart, a secret spring the world can, can't see and doesn't know anything about. The Lord gives his people perpetual joy when they walk in obedience to him. And Moody was spot on. Even when we experience troubles, even when we experience trials, even when we experience highs and lows, joy can be right there with us. It sees us through those things because when we live in the sphere of God's love, we experience that inner joy and sufficiency that's not affected by our outward circumstances. And the world doesn't get it because the world doesn't know Jesus. This joy keeps us going in spite of life's difficulties. Joy comes to those who have a deep and abiding love for God. When we walk in obedience with God, we experience his joy. And Paul says we experience his unimaginable peace. Love and joy together produce peace. Philippians 4, 7 tells us, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus. Aren't we all longing for some peace in our life? Aren't we all desiring a sense of peace, inner peace that just sets us at ease? I know moms here are. Moms are always looking for a little peace and quiet. There's a four and a six year old boy that wanted to do something special for their mom on Mother's Day, so they pooled their money and they went to the florist. They came home with this beautiful house plant and they presented it to their mom. And of course, mom was delighted to receive it. What mom wouldn't be delighted to receive a gift like that from her children? But her six year old was a little sad. And he said, We wanted to get you this beautiful bouquet of flowers that was at the floors, but we didn't have enough money for it. It was a pretty arrangement of flowers. It even had a ribbon on it that said, Rest in peace. And you're always asking for a little rest in peace. <laughs> Probably a good thing they didn't have the money for that one. Mom wouldn't have experienced the peace that she was desiring. Much, if not most, of the social turmoil of our culture, I think, is due to a hunger for peace in our lives. And we continue to hunger and strive after it because typically we're looking for peace in the wrong places. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. Now he was getting ready, he was talking to his disciples here, he was getting ready to go to the cross. And he knew that that was eventually also going to mean going back to heaven. And so Jesus, to, to help them understand, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid of fear. Do not be afraid. The beauty of that passage to me is we are continuing to seek for peace. We're continuing to long for peace in our lives, but we already have it. Jesus said, I leave it with you. I give it to you. It's yours. Here's my peace. Have it. And when we enter into a relationship with him, we receive that peace which surpasses all human understanding. Peace is something Christ has given to everyone who has believed in him. When we love God with all of our hearts and feel his joy in our life, we have a peace within because we know that we are in a right relationship with Jesus. Jesus was the embodiment of God's peace because of the relationship he had with the Father. If you look at Luke chapter 8, Luke tells us this story about Jesus and the disciples. They had gotten into a boat, and when they got in the boat, we get this impression that Jesus fell right asleep. And as the boat was going across the lake, a huge storm came up, and the boat began to swamp. In other words, it began to fill with water quicker than the disciples could bail it out. And the disciples were distressing, and they were not experiencing peace. And so Luke tells us they were in great danger. And then in verses 24 and 25, we read this. 
the disciples went and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. Jesus stood in front of Pilate, knowing what was coming at him and didn't speak a word. Jesus was able to sleep in the middle of a storm that had 12 men fearing for their lives. How? Because of his relationship with God. He had God's peace within him. And so that's the peace that he lived by. If you're searching for peace, maybe what you need to do is step back and ask yourself the question that Jesus asked the disciples. Where's your faith? What are you putting your faith in? Who are you putting your your faith in? What are you leaning on to try to find this peace that you're seeking for? There are several ways that peace is talked about in the New Testament. Colossians talks about a peace with God. This is a peace that was only made possible by Christ who became our peace. When Christ died on a cross, it made us allow, it allowed us entrance into a relationship with the Father that we could have never experienced otherwise. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 tells us, He being Jesus, He made peace through blood on the cross. You who were once alienated in enemies, He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death. Peace with God. <laughs> There's a lot of turmoil going on around the world right now. There's a lot of talk happening because of Russia and the Ukraine. And, you know, when you stop to think about it, for centuries we have been at war, some war, one kind of war or another. I pray that what is happening right now doesn't turn into war. But, you know, all of the wars... There even, there's even one labeled the Great War. All of the wars that we have experienced in, in throughout the centuries pale in comparison to the war that we face inside of us. And until that war, until our heart discovers the relationship that God created us to have with him, we will be at war within ourselves. And until that war is taken care of, you're never going to experience peace in your life because it happens with peace with God as a result of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Until we settle our faith and surrender ourselves, we'll never experience peace with God. Scripture also talks about the peace of God. God gives his own attribute to us. This peace that passes all understanding. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, Jesus said. But that peace has to do with character. Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 32, 17. The work of righteousness shall be peace. In other words, the peace of God has to do with our character, our righteousness. And we are not declared righteous until we enter into a relationship with Christ. People go about seeking peace in the wrong way. We want to change our circumstances to find peace, but Jesus wants to change our character so that we can experience peace. Peace like joy doesn't come from the outside in. It comes from the inside out. And so we can experience peace with God as well as the peace of God. But then there, Scripture talks about this peace in God. It's an attitude of our soul which knows that we have adequate resources for whatever it is we're facing. As a result of our relationship in Christ, I know that I have everything I need to face whatever I'm going to face today, tomorrow, or however long God lets me live. It has to do with companionship, my relationship with him. It's what Paul was talking about in this third kind of peace in this passage. You may, you, there may have been people in your life who you look at and you just say, man, they just, they just have it all together. And that's what, that's what this peace means. It's a sense of having it all together. Not 
when it comes to material things, but having it all together when it comes to our relationship, our companionship with Christ. When we know things are not right between us and God, when we know that there is unconfessed sin in our life that is blocking our relationship with God, when we ignore God's word and we allow our, our, our flesh to take over and we pursue the desires we have rather than the desires God has in this world, we end up worried and thinking God is out to get us. But when we walk in the Spirit, when we have companionship with Christ, living out our love for God and experiencing the joy of God, the result in our life is peace. Because we know that those things are no longer blocking, hindering our relationship with Him. The secret to peace is companionship with God rather than companionship with the world. God walked with Enoch and Abraham. He wants to walk with you. God spoke with David and with Moses, and he wants to speak with us. God went into the lion's den and the furnace, and he wants to share our trials as well. As part of the companionship, he's with us through all of these things. He wants to be our companion throughout every experience we have. But he's not going to force us into a relationship with us. He's given us this free will. The freedom to choose whether to enter into a relationship. The freedom to choose whether we're going to pursue that companionship. The freedom to experience these things. God doesn't force them on us. It's a choice that we make. And when we enter into that relationship, we begin to experience his love, his joy, and his peace. Are you lacking joy? Would you like just a little bit of peace in your life? Then maybe you just need to stop. Maybe you need to be honest with yourself. Maybe you need to, as my pastor Charlie used to tell me, hit your knees in your prayer closet. Just you and God. And maybe you need to ask that question that Jesus asked of his disciples. God, I want peace. I want joy. Where's my faith? God, reveal. Where's my faith? What am I putting my faith in? Who am I putting my faith in? God, help me. I want to experience these things, so help me to put my faith completely in you rather than the things of this world. Jesus said when we seek him first, we find everything else that we need. Love, joy, and peace, they enhance our relationship with God. We experience them when we enter into a relationship with God. So how are you doing? If you're missing those things, don't let fear cripple you. Don't let whatever it is that you're dealing with that Satan is putting in your way as a stumbling block to keep you from experiencing these things. Go along with life. Seek God. Like I said, be wise, especially when it comes to this virus. Be wise. But don't let it keep you isolated from people. Don't let it keep you from experiencing the joy of living because you're locking yourself up. Experience the love, joy, and peace that God has for you. Simply through the relationship that Christ died so you could have. Father, we thank you for this reminder. This fruit of the Spirit that speaks boldly to us today. Father, help us. As your Christians, as your followers, you're calling us out to be the reflection of Christ's likeness. So, Father, help us as we seek love, joy, and peace in our relationship with you. Because once that happens, we'll have it to share with others. Father, speak boldly to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus, then what's keeping you? What is Satan using to distract you? Satan knows that once you do, you'll experience love, joy, and peace. But he doesn't want you to experience that. So what is he doing to keep you from it? Maybe it's time to deal with that first. If you'd like to know more about following Christ, I'd like to have a conversation with you. You're online, connect with me. Maybe the Spirit's spoken to you. Where's your faith? Maybe the Spirit's spoken to you in some way. You just know right now you need to take care of some business with God before we leave this place and head back out into the world. 
So whether you decide to pray here where you are, pray with me, if the Spirit is speaking to you, you've got some business to take care of, don't let Satan rob you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But God wants you, Jesus wants you to experience life in the fullness. So don't let him rob you. Don't let him steal. Don't let him destroy. If you'd like to know more about being part of the Bill Creek family, as together we seek to share the love and the joy and the peace of God with those in our community and around the world. We'd love to have that conversation with you. Maybe there's something else the Lord laid on your heart that I've not mentioned. You just know you have to take care of it before you leave this place. We're going to stand. We're going to worship. We're going to sing one more song. It's an opportunity for you to just pray. It's an opportunity for you to respond. It's an opportunity for you to worship. You have a decision to make. You want to make it public. I'd love to hear about it as we stand and sing.